perspectives after coming from the break. Uh, so we, we have been trying to uh, build uh, some kind of a proposition that the states will not be the same or at this point of time, it is not the same that they are changing their own nature. We will, keep, we will try to come to the second point of our discussion that we have already raised at the very beginning that will there be any, will this, this pandemic will reshape geopolitics? Will there, will there be some kind of a change in the political scenario? Uh, will there be a change in the course of action for uh, the relationship between US and uh, China? Will there be a change in a, a polarity of the world? Will there be a multipolarity? Will there be an emergence of any other uh, superpower or these sorts of questions? Because many uh, commentators, uh, many of them have predicted uh, the end of an era of globalization and uh, that has prospered under the US leadership uh, since 1945. Some see a, a turning point at which China surpasses the United States uh, as a global power. Why thing? Uh, certainly there will be uh, changes, but one should uh, also be wary of uh, assuming that big, big causes have its big effects. I think I have already demonstrated some of the big causes, for example, <coughs> 9-11 uh, and the financial crisis. Certainly there will be changes, uh, according to me, certainly there will be uh, some kind of a changes, but one should be, uh, should be uh, uh, wary of the fact that the, the, the big effect, I, I will be explaining it to you. It is basically a dislike kind of a thing, or dislike of or a prejudice against people from other countries. It may be country, it may be tribe, it may be society, whatever it is. But it is a kind of a prejudice notion which is there, which is being instilled by the state. That is why you will be always be seeing some kind of a circulation that is going in specifically in the social medias that this is a Chinese virus. The US president has already termed it, it, it is as Chinese virus. Somebody has also you can also see that uh, Pakistan wants aid from India. Or for example, this is a notion of uh, uh, the European, uh, sorry, Asian race. This is a kind of thing that state is perceiving us to look at that. Way. It is the high time that state wants to instill this kind of a xenophobic attitude to us because xenophobic attitude and the other two that I will be explaining later on. These three things will instill nothing but a some kind of a prolific nationalistic attitude. And remember, every political party from Southeast Asia to America, most of the political parties in each of the superpowers are right wing nationalistic popular populist political parties and their basic foundation was this kind of a xenophobia for example if you uh, and that's what i am trying to say uh, 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 whether you exactly know about what has happened in uh, philippines or uh, japan or there 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 are events there are events that was xenophobic Similarly, there, uh, I will be I will be explaining I will be saying all those events. Uh, hopefully, that will uh, be interesting for you. But the point is that there are other two there are two other points also. For example, the security, the security measures has been. I'm I'm talk, not talking about the state security. I'm talking about the security that is being put on, that that on the name. Uh, yeah, somebody would like to speak. Vinay, yeah. Okay, Vinay. Yeah. So what I'm what I'm studying? Mm. Yeah. On the name, it is the name of the state security. The entire region, on the name of the pandemic, the entire region 
has been put into halt that is why uh, uh, this is not because of the fact that I, I have been to South Korea and I have been to in major parts of the South Korea for my uh, last one year 2019 but that is why I think South Korea has done a remarkable case in this scenario that South Korea has held its election in the midst of this pandemic. South Korea has held its national assembly, that means their parliament, their parliament assembly election within this pandemic. And my, my, my God, the, the turnout for this election has been 10% more than the previous years. That means 2016, they held their national assembly elections uh, after a duration of four years. That means on 2016, it was around about uh, 53, 54. This time it is 65% that has turned around, the voters have turned around in South Korea within this pandemic. And see, there are many states which are not only with, withholding the elections, there are many areas which has already clamped down martial acts. I mean, the military has been enforced. I am not propagating, I am not preaching any kind of a human right activist. I may sound so, but I am not preaching or not, not propagating like that. But I am trying to put up some of the points that are there that the state system has already changed its, its character. It has already changed the entire notion of how it sees the idea of the security. The security is being changed. Not only the external security, the internal security has already been changed. And number two, uh, sorry, number three, it's the surveillance. The surveillance has been the most impacted factor that is being there. Everywhere, if you go, the state surveillance has been on rampant way. The state has focused its major, major, it has overhauled its major surveillance factor into upon the citizens. In Malaysia, the entire um, army has been deployed in the chemical warfare suit in the name of getting rid of those infections. Japan has already clamped down its martial law and its emergency law has already been declared to search, to prosecute any of the citizens it wants. So that's what I am trying to say, that this gives me an immense kind of a thinking from the perspective of the state that there are uh, maybe various kind of thinking that can change the idea of international politics from this point of view of pandemic. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, that this kind of change, what we are, we, we are assuming that this kind of a change will bring some kind of an effect, but will that effect of a certain, fu some fundamental changes I have already st stated you the example of the 1918 and 1919 flu, uh, which has killed more than uh, the people of World War I. Yet the lasting global changes that unfolded over the next two decades were consequences of the war. I've already s said that. War was, w war was the reason which has accounted for the changes in the global politics, not the flu, not the disease. Similarly, the globalization of the interdependence across continents is the result of changes in transportation and communication technology. And these are unlikely to cease. That means globalization and the communication, the uh, superiority of the communication technology, this, according to me, this will not die soon. Some aspects of economic globalization influenced by the law of governments for example, the other aspects of globalization, such as pandemics and climate change, are determined by more, more by the laws of biology and physics. But 
not for the weapons, not for the walls, not for the tariffs. They do not stop at the, uh, at the transnational, this kind of a transnational effects, because they have some kind of a deep, persistent economic stagnation, which would slow them down. I have already mentioned that this century has seen three uh, crises in two decades. That's why US foreign policy was, has to take some kind of a distorted changes, which has led to long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. The second shock I've already mentioned, the 2008 financial crisis, brought up, which brought on the Great Recession, uh, that gave rise to populism in Western democracies, I've al already mentioned. And accordingly, these two, I mean, these two incidents, apart from this academic, China's fast, massive, and successful stimulus, stimulus package contrasted, that, that is contrasted with the West's, I mean, the Americans' uh, lagged response Many has predicted that China will, on course, will become the world's economic leader. Initial responses to the century's third crisis, I mean this crisis, the coronavirus pandemic, also went down the wrong path. You just, you just see how both Chinese President Xi Jinping and US President Donald Trump started off with a denial mode. Everybody is saying that, no, it has not happened because of China. U.S. is putting the entire blame on China and misinformation. Everybody is putting up these kind of a things, that kind of a things, delays and obscuse, of, uh, I mean, misinterpretation wasted very crucial time for testing and containment, and the opportunity to for uh, opportunity for international cooperation was squandered. I mean, instead of uh, instead after. Uh, Imposing certain costly lockdowns, the world's two largest economies engaged in pro <coughs> propaganda battles. China has blamed the U.S. military for the presence of the virus in Wuhan. You already know about that. And Trump has spoken about the Chinese virus. I've already said that. Even the European Union, with an economy which is uh, roughly the size of the United States, they have deterred in the face of disunity. They have been not... They have not given their response, this kind of a disunity that they have been seeing on the basis of the two superpowers. <laughs> it is because of, of the, the fact the virus will not care less about borders or about the nationality of its victims. The incompetence of its response has hurt the United States. I, I have already stated its, its soft power. It has already uh, is being done in cases of 9-11. It, it has already done in cases of soft power. China has provided aid, mind it. It has provided aid. It has manipulated statistics for political reasons and engaged in various propaganda, all in an attempt to, to turn the narrative of its earlier failure on this pandemic into one of the most benign response to the pandemic. Now they are saying, please welcome, please come, we will have the kit, we will give all kind of a monetary aid, monetary reforms, every, every sort of a thing. However, much of Beijing efforts to restore its soft power has been treated with skepticism in Europe, and elsewhere, in, and uh, you can also see the, how India is very much skeptical about China's response. This is because soft power rests on attraction. The best propaganda is not the propaganda. That is, you have to always keep it in mind in international politics. And that, that is the basic thing, which I think there will be changes, but not of a fundamental changes. Because in soft power, China starts from a very weak position. Uh, despite major uh, efforts uh, since uh, former president uh, Hu Jintao, who, who has announced, who had announced the uh, objective of increasing the country's soft power at the 17th National Congress in 2007, uh, Beijing has created its own obstacles by uh, producing territorial disputes with neighboring countries such as India, and by its insistence on repressive party control, which prevents the full talents of the society be from being unleashed in the way that. Uh, that has happened in democracies. Just for ex uh, just for citing an example, I can give it to you. It is not surprising that the uh, that global uh, public opinion polls and rankings, such as the soft power 30 rank, China ranks very low in soft power. It is also not surprising that global public op opinion polls and rankings, it, it, for example, in the soft power 30, it shows that China weak in soft power. The top 20 spot in the index are held by the democracies and uh, not like that of the uh, authoritarian or one-party rule in China. 
in hard power two. This is the part of the soft power. So if it if we come in the power of the hard in, in cases of the military uh, interference, that is known as hard power. In hard power two, the balance favoring the United States will not be challenged by the pandemic. I think so. Both the U.S. and Chinese economies have been hit hard. It has been hit hard like anything else. Not on not it has not also been been, been there uh, like in two thousand eight. Uh, and as have those of those uh, United States, European and East Asian allies. Before the crisis, China's economy had grown, grown into almost two thirds the size of the United States. But China entered the crisis with a slowing growth rate and declining e exports. Mind it, I've already told you that before this pandemic has happened, we have already seen a trade off between China and uh, US being South China Sea being the epicenter. Beijing has also been investing heavily in military power, but remains far behind the United States and may slow down its military investments. It has to do in a more adverse budgetary climate. Among um, other things that the crisis has exposed to China's need for uh, major exp expenditures on its uh, uh, inadequate healthcare system. Although, mind it, it is a socialist country which should have a, some kind of a good healthcare system, although it does not have. Moreover, the United States have geopolitical advantages that will persist despite the pandemic. The first is geography. It is, I mean, the chi China, uh, it is bordered, uh, I, the US is bordered by oceans and friendly neighbors. While China has territorial disputes with Brunei, Indi India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, uh, you name so, Vietnam. A second advantage which I want to point is the energy. The shale oil and a gas revolution has transformed the United States. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. Today, the uh, it's not today, I think uh, yesterday, the price of oil has fallen into negative. One barrel of crude oil has fallen into negative price. That means the petrol pump will give you money along with the uh, uh, petrol. So that has also happened. The shale oil um, and the gas revolution has transformed the United States into a major naval supremacy. United States have also has its third democratic, uh, sorry, demographic advantages. Over the next decade and a half, according to a, a certain research, you can say, the U.S. workforce is likely to grow by 5%, while China's will shrink by 9%, mainly of its results of one uh, ch uh, ch child policy of China. Also, if, if this is not um, good enough, there is also China's working age population picked in 2015, and India will soon pass China as the world's most populous nation. And it barely needs repeating. I, I, I don't think I need to repeat, but still I have to say that U.S. power also results from its place at the forefront of the development of key technologies, including biotechnology, nanotechnology, and information technology. So US and other uh, Western research institutions and universities, they dominate the higher education. So all this suggests that the COVID-19 pandemic is unlikely to prove, according to me, any kind of a geopolitical turning point as what we, we have seen earlier in 19 and 18 and 19. All this suggests that the COVID-19 pandemic is unlikely any kind of a, any kind of a geopolitical turn will take place. But we have also uh, we have also we have to keep it in mind that um, while the United States will continue to hold most of its high curves, misguided policy decisions could cause it to play these um, cards very poorly. Discarding the aces of alliances and international institutions would be one such misguided decision. For example, uh, another one would be a severe restrict restriction of immigration. You know, or, or, I think hopefully you know about the problem of immigration. Uh, I'm just putting it as an example, but that means long before this crisis, uh, there was one Singaporean prime minister who has been asked by uh, one of the famous scholar on United States that what did it think uh, uh, that China would surpass uh, the United States as a global power anytime soon? Uh, the one reason uh, he cited was the United States' ability to draw um, on the talents of the entire world and to recombine them in diversity and uh, creativity. 
given uh, uh, the chinese chinese ethnic han nationalism this kind of openness would be impossible for china but it if populism that means the populist politics leads the united states to toss away its valuable cards of alliances alliances with canada alliances with europe international institutions for example it has already given a heavy threat to uh, who world health organization and its openness so i don't think that commentator um, might be in wrong or rather the singaporean minister will be uh, wrong that us will lose its alliances and that will be taken up either by china or anyone else all the things that i am saying i am just conjecturing i am making some of the wishful wishes nothing else that's why i am saying but alternatively there is a new us administration that might take its cue from the post 1945 us presidents whose successes are there and which are there in every uh, academic scholarly uh, articles for presidents and foreign policy uh, from the times of uh, 1945 to uh, mr trump the united states Uh, could launch a massive covid aid offer uh, program uh, that's i think a medical version of the marshall plan i hopefully you have heard about the marshall plan it was basically a financial restructuring of the world order the marshall plan that i'm talking about it's a massive uh, covid 19 aid program can be launched uh, as uh, you know henry Kissing kissinger has recently argued leaders should choose a path of cooperation that leads towards international resilience so instead of competing in propaganda uh, what i think leaders could articulate the importance of power with rather than over others and set up bilateral and multilateral frameworks to enhance cooperation rich countries should realize um, that recurrent waves of covid-19 will affect poorer countries less able to uh, they are less able to cope up and that's uh, and that such a developing world reserve will hurt everyone if it spills back northward in a seasonal resurgence that means if it again resurges which china has already seen it was like that in 1918 when the second wave of pandemic killed more people than the first so both for the self interested and humanitarian reason the united states should lead the g20 in a generous contribution to a major new covid-19 fund that is uh, which i think open to all countries so if a us president uh, were to choose such cooperative and soft power enhancing uh, policies something good may yet to come out of this pandemic at least uh, uh, a better geopolitical geopolitical path uh, for a better world so you so but on the other hand on the flip side if us policies continue on the current path however the new coronavirus will simply accelerate existing trend towards nationalist pop- populism and authoritarianism of which the trend we are already seeing in many of the southeast asian countries many of the latin american countries it it can see the existing trend can change towards nationalist populism and authoritarianism but uh, i think uh, it is still too much early to predict a geopolitical turning point uh, that would uh, fundamentally alter the power relationship uh, between the united states and uh, china so uh, that's what all i have to say in the cases of uh, uh, this uh, entire range of the portion that is the theoretical portions needs to be engage oneself to the changes that will occur after the pandemic and likewise what has happened in 1919 likewise there will not be any kind of any fundamental changes but of course there will be some kind of an operational or cosmetic changes that one can be seen so the notion that is going on through the entire social media or the media that the world will not be ever again i personally believe that it will not be like such the world will again resume on a positive note because the basis of world politics and economics is not the uh, biology or physics it's economy and my dear it's only the economy that constructs the everything from everything with uh, the order that is being seen there the, uh, the existing order that is being seen there